Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Katerina Schiavoni will defend her academic thesis, Multivariate State Space Methods for Official Statistics and Climate Modeling. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Corrector. I'm now sharing my slides, so I hope that you can see them. Yep, we do. Okay. Uh, dear Corrector, members of the Corona, family, friends, and audience, thank you for joining me today for the defense of my PhD thesis. I would like to start by explaining what is that applied econometricians do for a living. And I think that I can easily do so by using as analogy, the job of collecting grain with tractors, of uh, processing grain with flour mills um, in order to produce bread, which is the end result. And similarly, we collect data, mainly with our computer. We process and analyze this data by means of econometric models and estimation methods for these models in, or in order to produce our results, which in the case of my thesis are estimates, forecasts, and now casts of variables of interest, like the unemployment or the level of air pollution of a country. Now, the novelties of my thesis are represented by the data that I use and by the econometric methodology. And of course, also the results will be new by construction. And I would like to spend just a couple of words on the methodological part. You can think of the econometric model as the flour mill that is used to process the grain and of the estimation method as the power that is used to make the mill work. Without power, the mill is useless. And you could use different types of powers that can be manual or electric energy and based on the type of power that you use, you will get different types of bread and some may be better than others. Now, the econometric models that I use in my thesis are called state space models and are suited to analyze time series data. And I use these models in all chapters. So that's what glues all chapters together. However, the estimation methods that I employ to estimate these models differ among chapters. But I would like to focus this presentation on the data that I use and on the final results. As you know, I have done my uh, PhD at Maastricht University and Statistics Netherlands. And there, there is a lot of interest in um, obtaining very accurate estimates of official statistics as the level of Dutch unemployment. And in order to achieve this high accuracy, it's possible to use different data sources that are all informative about uh, the level of unemployment, because intuitively, the more data sources you use, the more information you use, and therefore the higher the accuracy that you will reach. So a Statistics Netherlands, they are currently estimating Dutch unemployment based on uh, data coming from the Dutch Labor Force Survey. And at some point, they also use claimant counts data, which represent the number of people claiming unemployment benefits. What I do in chapter two is to also use Google Trends uh, about job search behavior in order to improve this estimation accuracy. And these Google Trends roughly represent how many times some search terms that may be used by unemployed people to look for a job have been typed uh, in Google for a given period of time. What you see in this figure, uh, the black series represents the unemployment estimates based on the survey data. The green series represents the series of claimant counts. And the red one is an example of Google Trends for the search term web close, which is Dutch for unemployed. And you see that all these series tend to follow this, the same trend, more or less, and therefore they uh, seem all informative about the variable of interest, which is Dutch unemployment. Of course, there are uh, pros and cons with all data sources. So survey-based and claimant counts data are very accurate because uh, Dutch labor force survey uh, surveys are designed to measure the level of unemployment of a country and claimant counts exactly represent how many people claim unemployment benefit. 
um, but they are available at a monthly frequency and they are subject to a one month of publication delay, which means that uh, we do not have this data for November in November. We can only get this data in December, so we have to wait one month. Google Trends have the disadvantage that, of course, you can think of many search terms that are used by unemployed people to look for a job on the internet. And therefore, you will end up with a lot of these uh, time series, and some of them will certainly be irrelevant to, to estimate the unemployment. So um, it is necessary to uh, use the correct tools in order to extract the main information out of these Google Trends and figure out <clears throat> the noise as much as possible. But they have the great advantage that they are available at a very high frequency, up to a daily basis, and in real time which means that today on the 4th of November, we can already use the information coming from the Google Trends in order to uh, understand what is the current level of unemployment instead of just waiting for the data release of survey and climate, and climate counts in December. And for this reason, Google Trends can be used to now cast uh, Dutch unemployment, which means to predict its, its present value. And it turns out from chapter two that these Google Trends can, in, can improve the NAUCAS accuracy of Dutch unemployment over only using survey-based and climate counts data. However, these gains in accuracy are very sensitive to how we extract the, the main information from these many Google Trends and how we filter out the relevant ones. Let's focus now just on the survey and claim and count series. I mentioned earlier that they seem to follow the same trend over time. What I did not mention explicitly, but I assume in chapter two, is that the relationship between these two series is constant over time. However, if we look closely at this picture, we see that the two series are much closer to each other at the beginning and at the end of the period and they deviate from each other in the middle of the period. So between 2010 until 2016. So it looks like actually the relationship between these two theories is not constant over time. And the question of chapter three is why did this relationship change? And does accounting for this time varying relationship allow us to achieve better estimates of Dutch unemployment? So I mentioned that this year started deviating around 2010, which is more or less two years after the, the birth of the financial crisis of 2008. And this crisis was big enough to create long-term unemployment. However, unemployment benefits cannot be received uh, for more than a maximum of three years. However, not everyone is entitled to receive it for such a long time. And therefore, if uh, people keep being unemployed after uh, they, they finish receiving unemployment benefits, they will not be part of the claimant counts anymore, but they will still be unemployed. And therefore, we start seeing this deviation between the two series. And this also explains why the claimant counts in the middle of the period are much lower than the survey-based series. And what we also find is that if we account for this time-varying relationship, uh, we get more accurate estimates of Dutch unemployment at the beginning and at the end of the period where the series are much closer to each other, intuitively because their the claimant counts are much more informative about the level of Dutch unemployment, and less accurate estimates in the middle of the period. And this uh, lower, inac lower accuracy reflects the economic uncertainty of that period triggered by the, the, the financial crisis. However, what we also see is that at each point in time, we get more realistic estimates of Dutch unemployment, intuitively because a time varying relationship between the two series is more realistic than, than a time constant one. Now, the results that I uh, just presented are, were obtained with an econometric method that, uh, that worked, so that was successful. However, uh, part of the research also entails um, taking some directions in order to answer some research questions that do not uh, lead anywhere, so that they're, they, they're not successful. And also, and generally, these attempts are not published in articles. And while working on chapter three before finding the method that 
that works, I tried several other ones that were not uh, successful. And so this comic is kind of displays the situation where I would discuss them with my supervisors. Um, but I have anyways decided to include them uh, in chapter four in order to give a more complete picture of what uh, research entails and also all the work that is behind chapter three. So far, we have focused on the topic of official statistics, uh, specifically unemployment statistics. Um, however, chapter five moves away from this area and is more focused on the use of, of econometric methods to model uh, concentrations of air pollutants in the Netherlands. On the left hand side, you can see the concentrations uh, of uh, NO2, which is nitrogen dioxide, and it's a pollutant in Europe. And you see that this is mainly a problem in Northern Italy and around the Benelux area. And on the right hand side, you can see a zoom of this map on uh, the regions of the Netherlands, which are the um, geographical areas of interest uh, in chapter three, uh, five. So NO2 is uh, omitted during combustion processes, and these are mainly of anthropogenic nature. And vehicles are the main responsible for these emissions. And it is estimated that uh, they're responsible for around 30% of these emissions. Uh, NO2 can indirectly affect the climate and uh, directly affects the respiratory system. And it is therefore a pollutant of concern. And the goal of this chapter is to create an econometric model that uh, for these regional concentrations of NO2 in the Netherlands that uh, relates them to their uh, meteorological and anthropogenic determinants, and that can also be allowed to forecast uh, future levels of NO2 concentrations based on different scenarios of road traffic, and therefore um, such that the model can potentially be used also to evaluate uh, pollution reduction policies. Uh, the, this model should also take into account for the spatial dependence among regions, because as you can see from this picture, um, regions that are highly polluted are neighbors of regions that are also highly polluted in general, and vice versa. The border effect should also be taken into account because the regions in the, in the south uh, of the Netherlands are polluted also because um, part of NO2 is transported by the wind from uh, Belgium and Germany, which is not a problem, of course, for maritime regions. And finally, uh, on the left-hand side figure here, you can see the concentrations of NO2 in the Netherlands over time. And on the right-hand side, you can see a variable that represents the level of road traffic still in the Netherlands over time. And you can see that this latter variable is characterized by an upward trend, which means that on average, the number of vehicles uh, on the highways of the Netherlands increased over time. However, we do not see a similar upward trend for NO2. So this raises the question, is it because maybe vehicles have become more environmental friendly and therefore their effect on NO2 emissions has decreased over time and therefore changed over time? This is also a question that can be answered with this econometric model. However, we do not find any evidence for this. So it seems like uh, the fact that NO2 concentrations do not show an upward trend is probably due to the fact that other types of economic activities that are responsible for NO2 emissions have become more environmental friendly. We also use this econometric model to forecast um, NO2 concentration based on the hypothetical scenario that all vehicles are removed from the highways of the Netherlands, which of course is a very unlikely scenario, but it allows us to understand what is the maximum amount of NO2 reductions that we can achieve by uh, removing uh, road traffic. And that's uh, 35%, which is in line with the estimate of um, NO2 uh, of road vehicles accounting for 30% of NO2 emissions. And what we also find is that this reduction can be achieved in just eight months. 
I hope that I managed to convince you that Google Trends can be used to now cast uh, to improve the now cast accuracy of Dutch unemployment overall using survey based and claim income data. That the relationship between these two latter series has changed over time due to the financial crisis of 2008, and that accounting for this time varying relationship allows us to achieve more realistic estimates of Dutch unemployment. And finally, that the adoption of vehicles that are environmental friendly has not been enough in the Netherlands in order to reduce NO2 concentrations, but that this reduction can potentially be achieved very quickly. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I now give the word back to the prorector. Thank you uh, for your presentation and overview. The opposition will be opened by Professor Alain Heck, uh, who was the chair of the assessment uh, committee, and Professor Heck is a professor of applied econometrics at this Maastricht University. The floor is to Professor Heck. Thank you. So, dear candidate, dear Katrina, I would like to start in by congratulating you about uh, your nice piece of work. And as, as you know, I'm an applied econometrician, and I like very much that you you start with uh, with the data with a real economic motivation about how to improve the the knowledge of the of the data, and then you implement the the methods that is uh, suited to for, for to your goal. I like also very much your chapter four because it might um, of course you can think that you have collected things that didn't work, but I think you will help uh, future PhD students not to make the same mistake or maybe to find a solution to, to, the, to, to what you, you didn't succeed to get. And I, I think I will keep uh, your, one of your sentence. In particular, uh, I will quote your sentence too, in which you complain about R. I thought I was the only one to complain about R, but now I see that I'm, I'm in a good company. Anyway, my, my question uh, is about uh, your estimation and your improvement that you make in estimating unemployment for the, for the Netherlands. Uh, you show that you have some improvement, but I thought that the, the that statistic Netherlands had to provide some harmonized uh, figures to Eurostat to compute at, at Eurostat level some uh, European uh, unemployment uh, uh, or figures and rates. Uh, do you think that you can, I mean, uh, on with your alone, improve those numbers without uh, um, without talking with other member states about uh, the methodology that you use and try to to convince them that uh, they should use uh, this metal this methodology to improve the. Uh, the, the data. I mean, what is the, the role, a new role in this in this story uh, to, to, to work at the, the development of uh, more accurate data? And my second uh, small question is that an unemployment rate is um, what it's called in the business cycle literature, a lagging indicator. That means usually you have the coincidence, some leading and the unemployment rate is, is, a, is a lagging indicator. Hence, we know that most of the macroeconomic series will uh, help to forecast or to now cast uh, this, uh, this, this data. So do you have in mind to improve your model and to introduce uh, in your factor model, for instance, additional uh, indicators from macroeconomic time series or do do you think that using these uh, high frequency data like the Google Trend should be uh, should be further used in the, in, uh, in 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 the further in uh, in your research? Thank you. A highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your nice words and for your questions. Um, so uh, let me answer your your first question um, about. Uh, whether I would suggest to other uh, European countries to to use my method, uh, I, I think probably you refer to the method of, of chapter two in order to improve the real time estimates of Dutch unemployment. Um, 
uh, yes, I would suggest them, uh, especially because um, not all countries, I, I don't know exactly in Europe which countries have uh, claimant counts data and which other countries do not have them, but for sure not all countries uh, in, in the world have them, and and um, which of course represent a very good auxiliary series for the level of unemployment because it's a very precise series. Um, but since some countries do not have them, then I think that indeed Google Trends can, can represent an alternative. Uh, however, of course, as I also mentioned in my presentation, care must be taken on how uh, these uh, this Google Trends exactly are used to, to improve the, the real-time estimation of unemployment. And I, I'm not sure whether you also suggested to uh, use my method to kind of develop an, in, develop an indicator for the level of unemployment in Europe. No, I meant, I meant that... Uh... Uh, given that uh, we know that uh, uh, most economic uh, time series would uh, be a leading indicator for uh, unemployment, uh, is, would you suggest to, to increase the information sets and to try to see uh, uh, what, what type of series could, uh, in addition to the, your main series, could be a good now cast indicator for, for unemployment? Uh, yes, okay. Um, I guess that if you treat other macroeconomic series, for instance, uh, the variance that other, economic, other macroeconomic series like GDP are observed at a lower frequency than, than employment, at least in the Netherlands. And therefore, um, you could definitely like the model allows to also include this series. For instance, you could use uh, the GDP of the previous trimester to try to to now cast or forecast unemployment, and it can be that that still gives you some information if you treat indeed uh, unemployment as a lagging indicator, as you mentioned. Um, and that would actually probably work better for. Uh, for other countries that instead have quarterly observations for the unemployment. Um, however, I think that, um, so the model accommodates for them, of course, but I think it, it, it would be better to use uh, other series that are available uh, at a higher frequency in order to, to achieve more accurate real-time estimates of unemployment. I can also think of maybe some financial series uh, like stock market prices that especially in periods of economic distress may be uh, a little bit more informative about unemployment. And they're available at a very high frequency. So in this sense, they, um, they can work better for, for this purpose. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you so far. Thank you so far. I, I would like to uh, have the opposition uh, to be continued by uh, Dr. Nalan Basturk, who was also a member of the assessment committee. And uh, Dr. Basturk is an associate professor in econometrics at this Maastricht University. The floor is to Dr. Basturk. Thank you, dear Katerina, dear candidate. First of all, congratulations for your thesis. I read it with a lot of interest. Um, I find it very challenging in terms of the technicalities, but it's also nice to see very relevant applications at the same time. So this was the very nice part of your thesis. My favorite chapter was chapter four, just like uh, Alain Heck. This is uh, some part that we usually get intuition. We don't share this intuition as detailed as you do in many applications. So it was a very nice piece of work. Uh, I was thinking that you expect questions from me from chapter five, because we talked about this when you presented your paper. But today I want to surprise you, so I want to ask questions from chapter three, especially about the simulations that you have in this chapter. So uh, you rightly suggest that you want to estimate the correlation, time varying correlation correctly in order to get good estimates for the variables of interest. If I understand it correctly, the main variable of interest or parameter of interest here is theta, the unobserved Dutch unemployment. In the simulations, you show us how good the correlation estimates are, but you don't mention how good or bad the estimated unemployment theta parameter is. So can you tell us what is the effect of correctly 
estimating the correlation in the cases that you look for on, on the main variable theta, the, the state variable. Then I have a shorter question again about these simulations. There's a one simulation setup that the model doesn't perform very well. That's the fast sign waves. I was wondering in which kind of empirical applications we expect such uh, data. So in which cases should we be careful about using your model? Because in all other experiments you do, you seem to do a very good job. Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for uh, your nice words uh, about my thesis and, and for your questions. Um, so in the, what I do uh, in the Monte Carlo simulation study of chapter three is um, I, I also check the, um, the estimation of accuracy of the state variables of interest based on, on the estimates of the time variant correlation. And the conclusions of this uh, study is that uh, if the estimation is done on the entire sample, so I'm only interested in, in sample accuracy, uh, then uh, the estimates of the state variables of interest and therefore also of theta, which is the unobserved Dutch unemployment are not very sensitive uh, to uh, the different estimates of the correlation parameters. So, they're not sensitive to the matter that is used to estimate this correlation parameter. However, uh, the problem with this simulation setting is that um, it rewards too much the, the constant estimation of the correlation parameter and the cubic splines estimation. So the, the estimation methods that are based on maximum likelihood because, um, because they use the entire sample information. Whereas the bootstrap filter uh, it's a filter and it's only only uses past information and therefore it's a real time estimator of, of the correlation parameter and and it doesn't use the, the entire information at, at every point in time so also future information and um what i what i therefore did in the empirical application is i checked uh, whether the estimation accuracy uh, of uh, or whether the estimates that I get for Dutch unemployment, when I carry out a real-time estimation uh, of the unemployment with an um, extending window approach, whether that's whether I get more accurate estimates uh, use, by using the booster filter or the maximum likelihood based methods, and I get more realistic estimates with the booster filter. Uh, because in that case, if I do the comparison in real time, then in that case, the maximum likelihood based methods also do not use future information. And the booster filter is much better in promptly uh, tackling this change in the correlation than the other, the other methods. And so it's something that I did not do in the simulations, in the Monte Carlo simulations, because it's computationally uh, a bit intensive. And then I only did it in, in the empirical application. So it's Mm, to summarize, it's only if I do the comparison in real time that I also get different estimates of the state variables of interest and so also that's an employment. And uh, regarding your second question, yeah, it's true that for the fast sign, the, the cubic spines estimator doesn't uh, work well because uh, it's not able to um, to tack such a fast changing um, time varying factor and the booster filter there instead performs better and mainly because you have to for the cubic splines at least the way I implement them you have to choose the location of the knots beforehand so how flexible basically the splines is in, in tackling the, the time varying change of the correlation um, and such a fast changing uh, correlation I think that empirically, empirically could be observed when you have um, uh, more noisy uh, auxiliary series. So I can imagine that if I would try to model the relationship between the survey series and the Google Trends uh, as time varying, there I would probably see a more fast changing correlation because uh, yeah, because Google Trends are definitely more noisy than, than the claim and counts series. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> the opposition will be continued by Professor uh, Tommaso Proietti, who was also a member of the assessment committee, and Professor Proietti, 
is a professor of economic statistics at the Tor Vergata University of Rome. The floor is to Professor Proietti. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, Caterina. Um, I enjoyed re reading your thesis, uh, which I received in, in a paper this morning. Um, and my um, questions uh, are going to be related to your uh, uh, climate econometrics application in chapter five, which is very interesting. Um, in particular, I would refer to your uh, uh, figure 543, which uh, uh, you, know, you brought up uh, in your discussion. Um, uh, I think that it's a very interesting point to be made about uh, the relationship between NO2 concentrations and uh, traffic. Uh, you know, and uh, there is a point there that the aggregate relationship is, of course, uh, uh, hiding the fact that uh, the cross-sectional relationship is a positive one. So traffic affects uh, NO2 concentrations uh, across the 40 uh, uh, Dutch regions that you consider. And perhaps uh, having a scatter plot of this cross-sectional relationship would be interesting to have, just to point out that there is a positive relationship. Uh, and uh, this point should be made strong because the people looking at this picture would be sort of confounded by the uh, paradoxes, the apparent uh, paradox of aggregation. Uh, across the cross-section. Uh, so the, the relation is, is positive and, uh, 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 and also significant, as you show, uh, although not time varying. Also, this is something that uh, you could also <clears throat> argue from uh, your plot. Another interesting fact concerning this plot is that uh, there is a decrease in NO2 concentration at uh, around uh, 2018 at the end of the sample. And that seems to be related uh, by the amount of rain. It seems to uh, that uh, Netherlands was uh, subject to a very rainy period in that uh, time. Mm. And uh, perhaps the relationship with rain uh, could be important. Uh, another fact is that uh, there is a spike uh, around the end of 2012 uh, in NO2 concentrations should be around here. And that uh, seems to be related also to rain. There was a very dry uh, wind, uh, autumn in the Netherlands, it seems to be there. Uh, there is a sort of an outline uh, observation in uh, uh, rain there. Uh, and also, you know, uh, also the wind captures my attention. There is a spike uh, in, uh, uh, in the wind speed, uh, which perhaps, uh, and this is what I'm asking you is captured through this WT matrix, uh, the contiguity matrix, right? Which uh, incorporates this uh, wind uh, uh, speed uh, and uh, uh, measurement. So I would like to, to discuss uh, these facts. Uh, and uh, so uh, I would like to hear from you about uh, this uh, satellite fact that emerged uh, uh, about this uh, application. Another thing I would uh, do is perhaps to consider the inclusion of a time trend uh, in uh, the system so that uh, it could capture uh, any time trend in NO2 concentration and as well as in traffic, right? Uh, okay, thank you, Caterina. Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much for, um, for your questions. And, um, and for your comments on my thesis. Um, okay, let me start from the beginning. Um, yeah, yes, I guess that it is uh, from these aggregate uh, figures, it is probably not, um, uh, not uh, very, uh, since traffic is indeed the regressor, the main regressor of interest, this is not probably in, very clear to understand that traffic as a positive effect on NO2 concentration and a scatter plot could, could certainly be used uh, in order to, um, uh, to see this better graphically. Um, uh, however, this was, um, since I, I compared the results obtained with my proposed econometric model to a more simple uh, spatial-like model that assumes that the uh, 
regression coefficients are constant over time there i show i obtain the result that the effect of road traffic on uh, no2 concentration is positive uh, and significant uh, so that kind of summarizes uh, this this positive relationship um, it is true that uh, when I model this uh, effect as time varying, the, um, the confidence interval that I obtain with the, with the Gunman filter are not uh, show that the, the time varying estimate does not deviate uh, much from zero. And um, so there I have two remarks. One is that uh, these confidence intervals are point-wise, so um, uh, I can only check for each point in time whether the estimate indeed uh, or whether zero falls within the, the confidence interval built for that point in time. However, it is also true that if I would build simultaneous confidence interval that would allow me to understand whether uh, the estimates is, uh, whether zero is always contained in the confidence interval for the, the entire period, those simultaneous confidence interval will be even wider than the bond twice that I've obtained here. So the, um, these conclusions will not change. And I think, um, uh, of course, it, one, one limitation of my analysis is that my uh, sample size in terms of time dimension is rather small. I only have 80 observations and probably I do not have enough power when I estimate the model with the Kalman filter to, uh, to to check whether this time varying coefficient is indeed significantly different from zero or not with respect to, for instance, estimating the, the coefficient as time constant. So that would, so having more observation would probably give us a more clear, uh, more clear answer in this respect. Um, yes, there are some spikes uh, in NO2 concentrations. Uh, the one, uh, the upper one, I believe it's in uh, November. Uh, 2012. Um, due to rain. Um, I, for that one, I did not really manage to find a reason, uh, to be honest, because so, um, well, you, you suggested that it's probably the fact that rain was very low uh, on the same date on the same month and therefore since rain has a um, negative effect i find rain to have a negative effect in no 2 concentration it actually can be that indeed that spike is due to this very low level of rain in that month and uh, the um, instead the the very high spike of wind speed which uh, occurred in december 2012 explains the fact that uh, NO2 concentrations instead are very low on the same month, the same month because uh, probably they have been uh, transported away uh, from, from the Netherlands by, by the wind. Um, okay, but yes. thank, you. thank you so far. I would uh, like to have to give another member of the, the Greek committee an opportunity uh, for discussion with you. Um, Let's move on to uh, uh, Professor Paul Smith, who was the fourth member of the assessment committee. And Professor Smith is a professor of, of, of official statistics at the University of Southampton. And the floor goes to Professor Smith. Dear Katerina, dear candidate, um, thank you very much for your thesis, which I really enjoyed reading, although I found certainly some parts of it quite, quite challenging. Um, I'm going to echo some of the, the comments of my uh, fellow committee members in that I, I did like chapter four particularly that that it includes some of those uh, not quite dead ends but uh, parts of the thesis which didn't go as, as perfectly as, as you might expect um, but in fact I'm going to ask my questions around uh, parts of chapter two uh, relating to the Google Trends and the use of that uh, in improving the, the now cast estimates uh, of uh, LFS unemployment. So it was really great to, to read those parts. Um, um, I have a, 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 a small number of related questions. So I, I, I note that um, you're taking quite a lot of Google search terms all together at the same time and extracting uh, some information from those, which is then uh, making the 
the now cast estimate of unemployment uh, better. Um, so um, is it possible to say something from the factor loadings or from the, the information you get in constructing that single factor from the Google Trends data about what kind of extra information is contained in Google Trends, which is helping you to make this um, better nowcast prediction for unemployment. So I'd like some uh, some feel for what Google Trends data contains that's not already collected uh, in the Labour Force Survey or uh, already available in the claimant count. There must be some some new piece of information. The second uh, comment. Um, so you talk about uh, using the, the targeted Google Trends where you first extract uh, a smaller number of terms which are related with what you want, and you compare that with the non-targeted version. And uh, you, you make the argument that those uh, the non-targeted and the targeted versions are not much different when, when you uh, try fitting models with both of those. And therefore, that the non-targeted version is tending to ignore uh, the auxiliary series in the Google Trends that are not related to the target variable. Now, that seems to me um, convenient, but uh, not, uh, it's not clear to me whether that's a, a result which is true only for the situation which you are exploring, or whether it's a generally true result. So would I be able to rely on um, that kind of uh, ignoring of data, which is um, not predictive for what I'm interested in, if I was using your approach in a more general situation? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your questions and, and also for uh, your appreciation of my thesis. Um, so regarding the, the first question, um, yeah, so I find that indeed the claimant counts and the Google Trends tend to improve the estimation uh, accuracy of uh, different state variables, uh, which indicate the fact that they probably bring different type of information. So, um, uh, and I, I, um, since I relate the Google Trends factors to the change, in, in unemployment, so to the slope of the trend for the unemployment, um, the information that the Google Trends uh, should carry uh, is um, basically the number of people who uh, are becoming unemployment unemployed. So it should uh, bear more information about the change in unemployment rather than the level of unemployment itself, which should be instead contained on the claimant counts. And, and survey based series. Um, and uh, regarding your second question, uh, yeah, so this is a general result that the, the targeted Google Trends, uh, sorry, generally that if you target uh, like a high dimensional series of regressors before applying a principal components analysis that that can improve the predictive power of the factors that you obtain by principal component analysis with respect to not targeting them. And this is uh, this result was published by uh, Bayanang in the Journal of Econometrics, if I am correct. Uh, and the idea is that um, if you the, at least from the way I estimate principal component analysis, I have to make the assumption that the loadings are dense so that all the factor loadings are different from zero. And if you, and, and that is an assumption that has to be made even if in practice, this is not the case. So if in practice you have some series that are not actually predictive of the uh, dependent variable of interest, then you would still assign a non-zero weight to the, those series and these, uh, implies that uh, the the predict the the estimation of the of the factors deteriorate, and also uh, their predictive power. Yeah, but if I can um, interrupt in, in the thesis, you argue that if you don't do the targeting first, that the the process uh, of of fitting the model without the targeting uh, still gives you very small loadings on those. Um, trends which you would have taken out in the targeting process. So you argue in the thesis that there's not much difference between the targeting approach and the non-targeting approach in the model that's fitted. Uh, I... 
I believe that there is a difference. So what, what can what happens is that uh, if I do not do the targeting, then um, the estimates of this of the unemployment that I get are not that different in terms of estimation accuracy from the model that does not use any a, any auxiliary series, uh, which means that basically the the model that I propose is able to ignore a series if they are uh, not really related to to unemployment estimates, and they do it does not deteriorate the estimation of the unemployment. Therefore, I'm yeah. not sure if this answers your question. Yeah, that, that was what I was trying to ask, and I was trying okay. to, whether that whether that is a general result. Uh, that is. Uh, that is just, I think it's just, I don't know if it's a general result, but I think it's just due to the fact that um, the correlation parameter is a correlation between innovations, which are uh, stationary, so you do not have any spurious um, relationship problems. So uh, if the correlation is estimated as being close to zero, then simply uh, it is almost equal as estimating the, the state space model for each series separately, because the series are not related to each other. Yep. Okay, sorry, I didn't understand you at first. Yeah, no, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Peter Schotman. Uh, professor Schotman is Professor of Empirical Finance uh, at this Maastricht University. The floor goes to Professor Schotman. Dear candidates, I also very much enjoyed reading your thesis, and I was especially interested in your chapter five, which addresses something that is of extreme policy relevant <laughs> nowadays in the Netherlands. And my question will be more or less a continuation of what Professor Proietti was already asking you. So you were cut short by the chair on answering uh, Professor Proietti, but you may have a chance to continue some of your answers. Uh, what strikes me in uh, this model that you have, your, this spatial model where you try to estimate or assess the effects of traffic on these nitrogen uh, concentrations, or these NO2 concentrations. And the first thing that basically struck me is you, you argue for a time varying parameter, and that's what you implement, and you do all your common filter technology, and that's all, yeah, you know, all the technicalities of that, and that all works. But then it's a little bit of disappointing to see when I was looking at the results that apparently time variation in this traffic parameter is not something that is very important. It turns out that you can hardly estimate the variance of that uh, time variation. You get an enormous standard error there. So, and if you look at the graph, it looks like you almost get noise. Whereas with a constant parameter, it's everything looks more reasonable. And so the, my first, so am I right there is that basically there is no time variation in this uh, traffic parameter. And, but that's more like an introductory question. I think the real issue here is what already Professor Proietti pointed out is that it's much more like a cross-sectional identification that you have. You get it from that apparently some regions are different from others. And in regions with more or less traffic, you may have more, you may have higher or lower concentrations. That so this seems to be the more important uh, thing that you get from your model. And then when we get to something like that, we basically, I would go back to your spatial uh, model uh, that you introduce. And then well, we have there a spatial model, which is basically a kind of a panel data model. So we also have all the kind of issues that we have with panel data models. And we have what, what you have in your model, you have lag dependent variables. We may have to worry about pooling restrictions. Is this beta really the same uh, for all the regions? And you, you make an assumption that it's maybe not the same for all time periods, but we may equally worry that it's not the same for every region. So we may want to, uh, instead of modeling time variation, we may want to model cross-sectional variation in this beta traffic coefficient. We may have to worry about all kinds of time effects and uh, fixed effects, and whether we call them fixed effects or random effects. Therefore, these different intercepts, 
you basically say, okay, there is so there is a limit. There are some differences in the intercepts, but we treat them as kind of uh, uh, random effects. And so you get into all the difficult uh, panel data issues when you're modeling something like this. So I would more, what I would like you to ask is to reflect on if you would have to do this modeling again, uh, how you think about all these uh, panel data uh, problems uh, with your data. And I have one final question, if the chair allows me, why did you stop your data in 2017? Because when I looked at the website of this team is, it seems like the data goes all the way to 2021. So why use such a short sample? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your questions and, and for your kind words. Um, so yes, it is true that uh, I do not model uh, the heterogeneity among the regions. Um, it's, I do not model the differences among uh, regions as you would do in a panel data setting with a fixed or random effects. And that's definitely a shortcoming of my analysis. Uh, but uh, potentially you could do that. And that's also something that I did in one of the Monte Carlo simulation settings where I assume that every cross-sectional observation are its own, has its own uh, state uh, variable. So this is something that you can definitely include in the model. And, and in order to avoid a parameter proliferation, you can assume that the dynamic equation for all of these state variables is the same. Or maybe you can, again, group them state variable group the state variables according to some features of the regions and such that you do not have to estimate too many uh, parameters by maximum likelihood. Uh, however, um, in, in my empirical analysis, I can do that. So I can estimate the money in that way. But I again think that then the estimates of the state variables because of the very little observations that I have will not be very accurate. Um, and uh, the data for uh, traffic intensity, uh, uh, well, when I collected this data, the last available information observations were in December 2017. And I checked them again before the summer. And there, there was also data for 2018. So it can be that they updated it <laughs> again now. And there is more information, which can would be definitely more useful in order to improve the estimation accuracy of the model. But I stopped there just because when I started doing the analysis, that was the data that, that was available. Okay, I only checked the data on the NO2 concentrations. I saw that that was available up to 2021. Uh, yes, no, I know uh, the other, all the other data, so also the meteorological data is uh, available until now, but uh, the problem is that then it's traffic intensity uh, data that is not, that uh, it takes a lot of time to aggregate this, uh, this information to the, to the monthly and regional frequency, and therefore they, they have a very long publication delay. So that's why all other variables are obtained for the same period. And if the chair allows me to ask a little bit of- Very shortly. Very shortly. Yeah. So for, your poli for policy analysis, you basically assume there's one beta for the, all of the Netherlands. And, but if there is re uh, definitely regional variation, maybe the effects of a reduction in uh, emissions from traffic or better cars or less traffic may not be maybe very much uh, a kind of region region dependent and so one aggregate effect may very much overestimate the effect do you agree with that yes uh, i agree that it um uh, should also uh, it is possible to also look at what is the effect on every single region such that maybe uh, there may be some regions that are more of concern because they have natural reserves, for instance, and therefore you may want to uh, check what is the, the effect of a change in, in road traffic uh, mm -hmm. on, on those, reason, those regions that are more of concern and therefore also um, set the, the that they change in road traffic also among regions in such a way that those will be less uh, polluted in the end. Thank you, thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Harm Jan Bonstra, who is the senior methodologist at the methodology department of the Statistics Netherlands. The floor goes to Dr. Bonstra. 
Thank you. Dear candidate, dear Katharina, uh, congratulations with a very interesting and uh, well-written thesis. I enjoyed reading it also, and, uh, especially chapter five, which is a very, uh, uh, very nice topic. And I also liked your use of directional uh, spatial dependencies uh, in terms of uh, wind speed and direction. Uh, but my questions uh, are about um, chapter three, mostly also a little bit uh, at the same time about chapter five. So um, <clears throat> uh, you use uh, multivariate modeling for estimating unemployment uh, using claimant counts as auxiliary series. And um, so the auxiliary series are modeled as additional dependent variables. Now, an alter alternative way of incorporating auxiliary series is uh, to use them as covariates in your model. And that's actually what you are doing in, in chapter five, and where you also allow some of the coefficients to be time dependent. And um, well, using time dependent or then dy dynamic regression coefficients is also a way of modeling changing relationships between dependent and auxiliary series. And to me, it seems to be a simpler and computationally cheaper way uh, to, to, to use auxiliary series then uh, by means of multivariate model, as you uh, described in chapter three. So uh, for example, um, I read on page 89 in chapter three that uh, you also considered using claimant counts as a, as a covariate, as a regressor in the, in the measurement equation. Uh, but then uh, the estimated unemployment trend would become a, a kind of residual trend, uh, which is less relevant uh, for statistical analysis. So I have the following question, uh, first a more general one, and a um, uh, more specific one, and, and a more general one. So um, why would you not include claimant count series as a covariate in the structural equation of your model and consider it part of the trend? And uh, well, if you would do that, then probably you should first remove the seasonal pattern from the claimant count series. Otherwise, you would end up with uh, seasonal patterns in your trend, which you probably don't want. And second, uh, the more general question is, uh, under what circumstances would you recommend uh, multivariate modeling to incorporate auxiliary series? And when would you include them as covariates? Possibly with time varying coefficients. Thank you. Uh, esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your questions and nice comments on my thesis. Um, so I, the, the problem of including uh, the claimant counts as covariate in the observation equation of the model uh, is even if I would allow the coefficient for claimant counts to vary over time, which as you said, it would be uh, computationally much better because then you have a linear model. Uh, it's um, it's the fact that uh, in, in chapter two and three, I, I am interested in estimating an unobserved component so in getting more accurate estimates of the unobserved component. And, uh, and this specification would only allow me to get probably more accurate estimates uh, of um, uh, the observed series, which is not what I'm, which is the survey series, which I'm not really interested in because it doesn't really represent an employment uh, in my in my setting. Whereas in chapter five, I I do that because I'm interested in estimating the observed series, which is NO2 um, concentrations. Um, however, it can be as you said that maybe if you sum the estimates for the uh, residual uh, trend and the and the time varying parameter for for the claimant counts and it can be that that would also help the estimation accuracy of unemployment and that's something that can be definitely checked in practice would you like to follow up with this uh, professor dr bonstra yeah i would i would uh, so 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 do you have also a recommendation about the general uh, in the general situation when would you uh, use um, uh, multivariate modeling and when would you uh, use modeling uh, yeah, covariates? Uh, yeah, so I think that the situation would really be on whether the interest is in estimating or forecasting the observed series or the unobserved components. 
so in in chapter five, I I want to I wanted to create a model for NO2 concentrations, which are the observed series. And it, when I do the forecast exercise, I also forecast NO2 concentrations, and that's what I'm I'm interested in. But for uh, in chapter three, I am I do I. My interest is in estimating an unobserved component, not really the, the observed series, because those are the Greg estimates uh, from the, the, the Dutch Labor Force Survey. And therefore, in that case, when the interest is in estimating or now casting an observed components, I will do some multivariate model and um, exploit the, the information from the auxiliary series through uh, the state equation. OK, thank you. Okay, thank you. We are about to uh, see the beetle enter and um, exclaiming "Hora est" because we've passed an hour. Um, but uh, as as I was speaking about the beetle, "Hora est." Thank you, the uh, uh, dear Katarina Ciavoni. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. And the recommittee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. The def of your defense, sorry. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return.
Katarina Ciafoni, Ciafoni, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor van der Brakel is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I invite your supervisor, Professor van der Brakel, to now take the floor. Thank you. Katrina, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? To be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible. What is your response to this? Yes, I promise. Great. Then, by the authority vested in us by law, and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Katrina Schiavoni, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. And as evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisors, affixed with the official seal of the university, which is now shown by the beetle. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Schiavoni, dear Katrina, it's a truly honor to be the first that might address you with your just accomplished title. It's well deserved and let we start by warmly congratulate you on this achievement. Also on behalf of the other supervisors, Franz Palm and Stefan Smedes. This project started in spring 2016 when we defined a PhD proposal in the context of using big data into official statistics. At that time, Professor Jean-Pierre Urbain, Jean Urbain was also involved in this project as a supervisor. And we were looking for a candidate that was motivated to work on the interface between official statistics and academic research. Jean-Pierre, who was also a supervisor of your master thesis, proposed you repeatedly. And now I cite him. Katrina is theoretically strong, and I wished I could recruit, recruit her for one of my theoretical econometric projects. But she doesn't want to. She would rather do something more applied that also makes sense. And indeed, at that time you worked for the UN Refuse Agency in Copenhagen, but that was a little bit too much applied. So we were happy that you agreed to start in April, 2017 on this PhD project. And Jean-Pierre could have proposed a better student for this project. You started developing a dynamic factor state space model to combine survey data about <clears throat> employment with the Google Trends in an attempt to improve the estimates for the unemployed labor force in the Netherlands. It turned out to be a very hard job to squeeze some additional information from this big data source. And at some point, I got associations with the well-known phrases of George Box. I think all our colleagues here present definitely know the phrase, good models do not exist, but some of them are useful. Personally, I hate this phrase because its use is over the top. There is, however, another one that is less known and that partially fits to you. And this phrase reads, artists, painters, and statisticians, or econometricians, if you want, share one bad habit. And that is that they tend to fall in love with the model. This one applies partially to you. And I emphasize partially. It was, I was really amazed at the precision with which you researched all possible options to gain information from the Google Trends. But at some point you agreed with us that it was time to write a paper where you proposed your method, apply it to the labor force data, admit that it is difficult to illustrate the contribution of it in this application, but that the model has many potential applications to use big data for official statistics. 
We submitted the paper to the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society and went on with the next project. And after six months, we received the review reports. The paper was well, was well received by the referees and in particular by the editor. But each review report contains, if you're lucky, a few appraisals, but always an however. So I was looking in the reports, where is the however? And indeed, the editor emphasized, and I cite again, although this is a very important paper, I have, however, the feeling that there is more room for research. And I thought, oh God, there we go again. But you bravely picked up the gauntlet that the editor had thrown at your feet, and you continued bravely to explore all possible options to squeeze information from the Google Trends in this application. And at the end of the day, you succeeded to show that these Google Trends, even in this application, indeed contain some new information without falling into the trap of data dredging. So I must commend you that you fell in love with the Google Trend model. And in your case, I would not call this a bad habit. You consistently worked on it until the point of reaching a clear positive contribution with this model. Your second project, where you developed a method to, to estimate time varying state correlations in state space model, models was even harder. And I think I speak for all three supervisors if I say that we were very happy that Professor Koopman joined this project. His expertise and enthusiasm was indispensable for the successful completion of this project. And at the end of the day, this paper makes a really good contribution to the field of state space modeling. But it also makes the use of auxiliary information in the production of official statistics more realistic. Again, I think it speak for all three of us that we were amazed and impressed by your enthusiasm to learn new theory as well as your professional and crit critical attitude towards your own work. This brought you a lot, not only a great PhD thesis and a good journal paper, but it also enabled you to captain the Maastricht University team at the Economic Games in 2019 that ended second place, leaving prestigious universities as Harvard, Cambridge, and Oxford behind. Now, towards the end, of your PhD, you made up your mind concerning your next career step, and you decided to, de to develop further into the direction of climate econometrics. So your third project was therefore defined into this direction. The corona crisis, unfortunately, prevented a visit to the Center of Spatial Data Science of the University of Chicago. But it did not stop you to work with this research group virtually. The corona crisis also did not stop you to finish your thesis in time, which is an achievement on itself. Doing PhD research can be a lonely job, but doing it in isolation in an attic room makes it twice as hard to find the motivation to continue. And some students, for some students, this is a reason to stop, but not for you. Towards the end of your appointment, you were on the one hand worried if you were able to find another position that meets your future career plans. But on the other hand, you're also very keen towards your next step. Indeed, it had to be an appointment in an institute that does climate research, but preferably not a university. And on top of that, it also has to be located in North Italy, Milan preferably. Geneva was also an option, but all other options we suggested were politely parked as plan B. And at the end of the day, you succeeded in your plan. Two weeks after your appointment in Maastricht ended, you started as a researcher at the Eni Enrico Mattai Foundation in Milan, where you're now conducting climate research. Now, to end this laudatio, also on behalf of Stefan and Franz, I warmly congratulate you, as well as your family, on what you accomplished today. It was a true pleasure to work with you. And we wish you all the best in your career in climate econometrics, as well as your private life. And we hope that you can make all your plans and dreams come true. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Dear Dr. Schiavoni, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you, your family, 
friends and your supervisors with the honor you have acquired. And I would like to thank the members of the degree committee uh, for their contribution today. I hereby declare the ceremony to be ended. Congratulations once again. Thank you. Thank you very much.